Hey everyone and welcome back to By Haliji. Welcome to today's video. So as you can tell from the title, this video is going to be all about histone modifications and specifically histone post-translational modifications. And it's going to be the second video in my kind of like epigenetics series or playlist. And if you are interested in like the basics of epigenetics, then I highly recommend you check out my first video and I will leave a link to that up here and down below. Histone proteins are the most widely recognized or the most canonical protein of chromatin. Chromatin itself describes the interaction of DNA with protein and these histone proteins of chromatin they can be modified and those modifications or those post-translational modifications more specifically they constitute epigenetic information so that is the topic of today's video i really hope you guys enjoy it and find it useful as always give it a thumbs up if you do comment down below and subscribe if you are new the final thing i'll just say before we dive in is that i have been working on biology notes so as i've talked about on my other channel so holly gabrielle i have been repurposing and modifying my notes from my undergrad at cambridge and my masters at UCL and I will be releasing those notes so there will be a link down below to the page some notes might be live by the time you're watching this video but if not I will leave it down below definitely watch this space and I will let you know when they are released question number one is basically what are histone proteins and we basically have five histone proteins so we have histone 1 H1 H2A H2B H3 and H4 but only four out of those five go on to form what we call the nucleosome a nucleosome is the base basic unit of chromatin. It is built in a controlled and highly regulated manner, just like a lot of things in biology. We basically take a heterotetramer and that is composed of two H3s and two H4s. And then we take two heterodimers of H2A and H2B. So putting those three parts together, so one heterotetramer, one heterodimer and another heterodimer, we form an eight subunit nucleosome core and that is what DNA will wrap around so that we can condense chromatin into the nucleus and specifically around one nucleosome we have 146 base pairs of DNA and that wraps around roughly 1.75 times so that is a nucleosome it's this octamer of histone proteins as well as that DNA wrapped around it. Very importantly then, the reason why these histone proteins can interact with DNA is because DNA is negatively charged. And these histone proteins, they have a net positive charge. And that's because they are rich in basic or positively charged amino acids. So like lysine and arginine, and obviously, unlike charges attract so the negatively charged dna associates with those positively charged histone proteins and that allows them to come together to form these nucleosome cores and a histone protein so an individual histone protein they are composed of a globular core and then they have two termini they have an n terminus and a c terminus they're basically two tails sticking off this globular core and just remember with proteins we always read them from the n terminus to the c terminus so the start of a protein is at the n terminus and the end of a protein is the C terminus. But what's most important about these histone modifications, these post translational modifications, meaning that we modify them after they have been translated on a ribosome, is that most of the histone modifications occur within the end terminus. Whilst we do see modifications to the globular core and the C terminus, they're just not as common and they're not as well studied. The final thing then to say is that histone 1, as I said, it doesn't form the nucleosome core. It's not one of those eight subunits. Instead though, it acts as the linker histone. So it helps to further compact chromatin and kind of like stabilize higher order chromatin structures. So now we're gonna move on to looking at histone modifications exclusively. Um, basically the first thing to say is that histone modifications are very diverse and they're very extensive. There are lots of them. There's like histone methylation, acetylation, phosphorylation, isomerization. There's a lot of them. However, the majority are reversible and there are three key processes involved in the dynamics of histone modification. The first process is histone writing. So we have histone writers that are basically enzymes that catalyze formation of a particular histone modification. So they just lay down this histone code. And then we have antagonists of our histone writers because we need to be able to erase histone modifications. So we'll have histone erasers and they are enzymes that basically remove the histone modification. The final process then is reading the histone code. So we have this histone modification. However, that's not useful unless we can, you know, translate it into an effect. 
and most of these histone modifications are discussed in terms of regulating gene expression so whether we increase or decrease gene expression and histone reading basically describes the process of as i said translating a particular histone modification into an effect on gene expression and this can occur in a direct and an indirect manner we can say so the first so direct reading of the histone code just basically means that that histone modification will impact that histone protein's interaction with either DNA or other histone proteins or both. That is a direct effect and we will talk about an example of that later. The second way then of reading the code is an indirect method of reading the histone code and this involves separate reader proteins because they come and they will bind to a particular histone modification and they will bind with like a favorable binding energy and in binding to that modification they will enable that modification to have an effect on gene expression so they kind of act as an intermediate you know this reader protein comes along binds to and recognizes a particular modification and it translates that modification into an effect on gene expression so whether we increase or decrease gene expression as i said compared to the direct reading of the histone code indirect reading is more common and it's arguably more biologically interesting because we have these separate readers and that gives us you know greater sophistication and complexity in reading the histone code but the most important thing to remember is that we have writing erasing and reading of the histone code and that reading can take place in a direct or an indirect manner. The two key examples of histone modifications in this video are histone acetylation and histone methylation. But before we go on to talk about those, I want to address histone modification nomenclature. Basically, how do we name histone modifications so that you aren't confused? So we're going to take an example. So for example, H3K27ME3. What does that even mean? The first thing that we do is we name the histone protein. So in this case, H3K27ME3, H3 stands for histone protein 3. And then the second thing is the amino acid. And that is written out as its single letter code. So every amino acid in the genetic code has a single letter name. So in this case, H3K, K stands for lysine. So we know that it's a lysine amino acid of histone 3. The number then that follows is basically describing the number of that amino acid in the polypeptide chain from the end terminus because as i said before we read a polypeptide chain from the n to the c terminus so again looking at our example we have h3k27 so it is lysine a lysine residue that is the 27th amino acid in that polypeptide chain from the n terminus and then the final bit of the name so me3 that is describing the particular modification so in this case me stands for methylation and the three stands for trimethylation so we have three methyl groups stuck on this lysine residue the 27th amino acid in this polypeptide chain of histone 3 so that is how we name them hopefully you will be able to understand the other names and deconstruct them but you'll get used to it and the more you look at these the easier it will become just like anything so now let's look at histone acetylation as our first example of a particular histone modification so histone acetylation it is written by a histone acetyl transferase or a hat and it is erased so the antagonist of that hat is a histone deacetylase so a hdac or a hdac and in order for that histone acetyltransferase that hat to catalyze histone acetylation it has to use a cofactor it has to use coenzyme a or co a and that allows us to lay down histone acetylation and then in terms of reading the histone code so histone acetylation it has a positive effect on gene expression. In other words, it increases gene expression and it does so in a direct and an indirect manner. So if we look at the direct method first, basically histone acetylation, what it does is it is added to lysine residues and it's specifically added to the epsilon amino group of lysine and this basically neutralizes the positive charge of lysine so if we neutralize its positive charge then it means that we're going to weaken its interaction with negatively charged dna and that causes relaxation of the chromatin so when we have increased histone acetylation or hyper acetylation then that means we have a positive effect on gene expression because we weaken the interaction of dna and chromatin and it means that transcription factors 
can access the DNA more easily and increase gene expression. On the other hand then, hypoacetylation, so decreased histone acetylation, will reduce gene expression because it means that the DNA is less accessible and so we induce a repressive state. Secondly then, the indirect effect of histone acetylation is mediated as I said before, through reader proteins. And with histone acetylation, the reader proteins, they tend to have particular protein domains that we call PhD fingers or bromo domains. And if we look at some examples then, the hats themselves, so the histone acetyl transferases, those writer enzymes, they often possess bromo domains. So that means we can set up a positive feedback loop because you can write the code and then you can also keep writing more of the same code because they're constantly being recruited via those bromo domains and then a specific example is h3k9 ac or acetylation and that is usually found at transcriptional start sites so the point on a gene where we start transcription and we start synthesizing mrna h3k9 ac obviously stands for histone 3 lysine in position number nine and it's being acetylated so that is histone acetylation we're now going to look at histone methylation and with histone methylation it is firstly written by a histone methyl transferase so a hmt and the erasure of histone methylation is catalyzed in a variety of ways but we can generalize this and say that it's removed by a histone demethylase and what's important with histone methylation is it comes in different forms. So we can have monomethylation, dimethylation, and trimethylation. And those are denoted by saying, you know, ME1, ME2, or ME3 when we name the histone modification. But there are also additional variations of those as well, but we won't go into too much detail. I just want you to know that we have monodi and trimethylation. And unlike histone acetylation, histone methylation normally has an effect on gene expression indirectly so it doesn't usually have any direct effect the second difference then between histone acetylation and histone methylation is that with acetylation as we saw before it almost always has a positive impact on gene expression so it increases gene expression but on the flip side with histone methylation the effects are more variable whilst it can increase gene expression some types of histone methylation can also silence genes so i'll just give you some examples to kind of like illustrate this so we saw h3k9 acetylation before and what's interesting about this is that it kind of acts as a binary switch because when it's acetylated we increase gene expression but when it's methylated we switch off gene expression so you know it's this kind of toggle switch or this binary switch between two different states and some other examples of methylation are h3k4me1 this is usually found at enhancer sequences in the dna and an enhancer is a particular sequence of dna that helps to increased gene expression we won't get into the details of that today but that's what an enhancer is and i just want you to know that this particular histone modification so h3k4me1 is usually found at enhancer sequences it usually defines and marks enhancer sequences so when we're looking for enhancers in the dna for example we can look for this particular histone modification which is really quite useful h3k4me2 or me3 then so the dye or trimethylation of this same residue that is usually enriched at gene promoters and a gene promoter is another regulatory sequence like an enhancer it increases the expression of a gene but unlike an enhancer which is usually found quite far away from the gene it regulates a promoter is found very proximal or close to the gene that it regulates it's normally directly upstream we then have h3k36me3 so a trimethyl mark this is associated with gene activation again and it's usually found in gene bodies so we will have a promoter upstream of a gene and then we'll have the gene itself and within that gene body we usually find this h3k36me3 if that gene is being expressed obviously if it's silenced then we won't have this histone mark because it is associated with gene expression. Finally, then we have H3K27, and this can be mono, di, or trimethylated. So we can have H3K27ME1, 2, or 3. And each of these marks are kind of like 
differentially localized throughout the genome and they also have different effects so hastreq k27 me3 we'll start with that one that is a well-recognized silencing post-translational modification and it's written or catalyzed by one of our two polycomb complexes and specifically prc2 so prc2 writes hreq k27 me3 and that results in gene silencing but as i said we also have mono and dimethylation of this same residue so hreq k27 me1 that is usually found within active genes and hreq k27 me2 is very diffusely localized throughout the genome and we think it has a role in silencing genes but hreq k27 me3 is the most well recognized of these three marks or these three histone modifications and as i said it has a role in gene silencing so that is a bit about histone acetylation and histone methylation but obviously there are loads of other histone post-translational modifications and i just wanted to address a few of those just to give you a bit of a flavor of the diversity and how extensive these modifications can be so as i said at the start we mostly see these modifications impinging on the n terminus of a histone protein but we can also modify the globular domain or the c terminus and a very extreme example of a histone modification and this kind of affects lots of histone modifications because we have observed a cleavage event where the first 23 amino acids of histone 3 are cleaved and basically removed so this is a very extreme example it's also irreversible and as i said any modifications to those first 23 amino acids will be automatically erased as a result of this cleavage event we also have things like histone phosphorylation and histone ubiquitination for example and the first so histone phosphorylation that is written by a kinase enzyme it's erased then by a phosphatase and it usually imparts a large and quite negative charge on the histone protein because of that phosphate group that we add. And then ubiquitination then, it is written by three enzymes that we call E1, E2, and E3. And then there are two examples of histone ubiquitination that have opposite effects on gene expression. So the first is H2A K119 monoubiquitination or UB1 and this is catalyzed by prc1 which works very closely with prc2 and if you remember prc2 is the writer enzyme that catalyzes formation of h3k27 me3 and is associated with gene silencing so this ubiquitination mark so h2a k119 ub1 is also associated with reducing gene expression However, on the flip side, we have a ubiquitination mark. So we have H2B K123 monoubiquitination or UB1. This is associated with activating genes and promoting gene expression. So that's everything I wanted to talk about in this video, but I just wanted to mention this idea of the histone language versus the histone code at the end of this video, because the histone code is what you'll hear most people refer to when talking about histone modifications because what we're basically describing is that a particular histone modification has a particular effect on gene expression. So for example, H3K27 ME3, that is associated with gene silencing, whereas H3K9 acetylation is associated with gene expression. So the histone code neatly describes the fact that certain histone modifications have precise effects on gene expression, whether we increase or we decrease gene expression. But this idea, this histone code is very much an oversimplification and nothing in biology is ever that simple. You know, we cannot say that one histone modification always has a particular effect because the reality is that a histone modification, the effect of a histone modification is very much context dependent. It's a lot more complex. So this idea of the histone language better encapsulates the fact that each histone modification will have a particular effect, yes, on gene expression, but we can't say exactly what that effect will be because we need to consider the whole cellular context and what else is going on in the DNA to the epigenome and everything else in a cell. So the histone code is fine, but I just think this idea of the histone language is even better. And obviously this video has only really just scratched the surface with histone modifications because all of these post-translational modifications, they can interact 
And then we have additional complexity when we consider how the histone writers, the erasers and the readers are actually recruited in the first place. And then histone modifications, they also play roles in disease because they can go wrong and they can be abnormal. And as I said, that contributes to things like cancer. So I encourage you to go and do more research if you are interested in this. And there will be more detail in the notes that I release all based on histone modification. So again, that will be linked down below. Definitely look out for those coming out soon. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up if you do. Comment down below any questions, any other video ideas. And yeah, subscribe for more biology content with biology. And as always, I will speak to you very soon in another video. Bye!